Yes, I remember when I came to that first stage reading, the very first time out of the gate before um, really anybody knew what this was going to be like, uh, you had Don and um, Andy speak after the play, and they made such a profound uh, effect on me. I just uh, was blown away by um, the sort of wisdom and perspective and... Um, and hope that they brought to the subject. And so I'm thrilled that they we have them with us here today. So please welcome to the screen, uh, Andy and Dawn Bronstein. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you. much for being here. And you know, you. I am gonna mention, cause I'm so grateful. I know you changed a few little last minute summer plans to be able to be. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you. I see you're wearing the t-shirts, uh, orange, uh, orange ribbons for Jamie. I'm glad to know that there are going to be donations for that raised by this production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, tell us, tell us a little bit about your experience of this. Oh, uh. Well, um, you know, we can't even scratch the surface of this experience at large. Um, you know, ours was more from an outside perspective, uh, just to kind of paint our picture. Um, I was an administrator in the school district on a medical leave, so um, I was currently off of work. Um, it was actually, you know, February, February 14th, so I had taken the day with my lovely wife and, and we went to the beach and um, rather than our normal routine of me walking down the street to pick up um, our son from school, we decided to pick him up by car, got back to the house where uh, my wife was vice president of the um, PTA. And this elementary school feeds into um, the middle school that feeds into Stoneman Douglas High Which is School. Diagonally from the school on the same street. Right, on the same street around the block from our house. Um, I had consequently started my education career at that middle school as a teacher there for 10 years. Um, it was my life as a teacher. It was, I, I created the best friends from that school that maintained being my friend. So fast forward um, to that day, we had picked up Bradley and uh, we had come back to the house and oh, Dawn met, met somebody in the driveway from the PTA and they were talking and all of a sudden we're hearing sirens and helicopters. Um, and that's one thing that resonates with us. Even, even I would say it's our PTSD. Whenever we hear helicopters and sirens, our whole family just kind of braces because of those sounds. Um, you know, and I heard those sounds and, you know, as the, the amount of police cars grew, you knew it was something big going on. You didn't know what it was. It was going across the highway that just passed in our backyard as well, which backs up to the Everglades. Um, and um, at the same time, I'm getting texts from people. I had received a multitude of texts during that time um, from teachers that were at the schools on lockdown, um, as well as from uh, friends who had scanners across the country as well as friends in law enforcement. So I knew it was going on. And um, at the same time, I'm trying to keep my son at bay. Uh, Dawn's in the driveway. She's hearing the same thing. I, I text her, get her in to take to Bradley, and I jump back to the phone. And all I want to do is run over around the block and go to that school and help out because I've been trained in crisis management as an administrator. Um, I actually started the district on some – um, some some more harder hard-lined uh, um, uh, protocols and um, scenarios where they actually use like flash noises in the halls for staff to learn and we did it in conjunction with um, the Margate Police Department nearby I um, mean that that really started that kind of process of the code red lockdown um, so I was a part of that I knew what that was uh, we did it all the time but you know, when I got the text that um, there was a shooting at Douglas, it was something that we just, we couldn't imagine. Um, you know, our school, this this great school that's that's tucked away in the, you know, in the corner of the suburbs of, of South Florida and, you know, very affluent area. And 
what what happened? What you know, it can't be true. And so, um, just like when a car accident happens, um, it it happens in a millisecond, but it also you see every second through there, um, and and each of those seconds as the clocks ticked. Um, my friends texting me how his students need to go to the bathroom. They've been on lockdown for three, four hours. Um, you know, it, it was it was intense, and there was a lot that went through it. But again, it doesn't compare to what the people in the schools faced. Um, it was really the days that follow that really resonated for us. Actually, let me back up one second. Um, we're a very close neighborhood, community, and street. Um, on our street, as we affectionately called the 108, um, just happened to be families like us with kids our age. Um, and right next to us lived the Guttenbergs, who you know we knew since their children, since Jamie was was born. That's when we moved into that house, um, and so we watched her grow up to 14. Um, you know, our kids were all best friends, and and you know there was um, it was uh, there were connections. There was uh, you know the parents were teachers in the district and psychologists in the district, and they all gathered at our house and therapists. Um, and, and they all gathered at our house to um, just kind of get the news together. We put the kids together, ordered them a pizza, and we all just sat horrified in front of the TV screen um, and going back in text. And mostly with Fred Guttenberg was our biggest concern. Um, obviously, I have several students and friends that are affected, um, but our friend Fred still couldn't locate Jamie. He found his son, Jesse but they couldn't locate Jamie. So, we're all texting, you know, we're texting and we're waiting and we're, calling. you know, they're sending out, you know, has anyone seen her? Please call this number. And we're shooting that out. Um, and there and, was a, at one point they said that they thought that they did locate her. And then that was, a and that was false. false. Right. There was a lot of unknowns, you know, um, there was, I don't know how much, you know, and I won't belabor the details, but there was some delays in responses and information passed. And so there was a lot of unclarity, whether or not they had the suspect, whether he's in the neighborhood. And, and Which so was right near us and right. we didn't even know. And yeah. And so the parents were um, unfortunately the last to find out that they had lost their children um, just based on process of who returned home. Um, and so we hadn't heard from Fred and we knew the word, the news was getting worse. Um, and it, it was true. And, uh, you know, the days that followed were really the ones that were most impactful for, um, our family. Um, I took to the only thing I knew, which was to help the best way I can, which is the same spirit that Jack is, um, you know, in that I, I immediately started finding out who I can help and how um, I stood out. We went to this school a, a lot, um, as much as it troubled us to go there. Um, it, we went there and we talked to the children and I found myself in this space of just being comforter, um, comforting people and talking to people. And I said, I have to do more. I have to do more. Um, I was recruited as a chaperone to go with the kids uh, to the state capitol, where I sat next to the governor. I sat with the kids. We went um, on a rotation of going to different um, doors of, of um, you know, the people there, and some had closed doors for us. Obviously, where they sat with gun reform was where we were able to talk, and, and you know, these kids did unimaginable. They spoke up beyond the adults, and they told the adults that they have to listen. And we have, um, but the message kind of seemed to um, dissipate there as things do. They get shadowed by other shootings and other things in the news. Um, and, and we're, to Washington. You know, oh yeah, and then I went with the kids uh, to Washington to march for our lives. Had, you know, front row spot. It, it was it was just an interesting time period, I got to know a lot of the kids that you saw in the news and the cover of Time Magazine and became friends with Manuel Oliver. We love him so much. Um, and he became a hero to Bradley because Bradley's a, a, an artist. And um, so it's just, I could go on, but uh, it's, it's, it's impacted our lives forevermore. We didn't want to leave and come to Manhattan Beach because we didn't want to leave our community. Um, that was in a time of peril. Uh, but things were already leading us down that road. There were so many circumstances that um, said we had to move closer to our family here. 
And, um, you know, shortly after that, we did that. And that's where Dawn met Lois. We, we didn't want to tell people that we were coming from Parkland. We just wanted to try to start fresh. And um, it, thank goodness we didn't because it causes us to push forward with this message that's hard for both of us to, to deal with. When I was picking Bradley up from school, we were actually stuck on, we have crossroads sort of like, um, I don't know, anywhere. just, yeah, anywhere, crossroads where our schools were, because the elementary is right here and the high school is right here. Um, it had already, like, think by the time I got him in line, um, there were already choppers and, and uh, motorcycle cops coming everywhere. Um, so by the time I got home is when it was super crazy. But had I not picked him up at that time, I would have never been able because they locked everything down. I have friends who all their kids were in lockdown for hour. And that's what Andy was saying in the middle school, the high school, you know, the. Yeah. And, and not only that Clifford, but you know, when you hear the helicopters overhead, I don't know how it impacts you guys. But when you hear it for, and this is what the news doesn't always weeks report, weeks. but we heard it for three days over that school while our, were, while all those children and everybody stayed in that school. And I'm talking about those that perished because there was just too much to go through that they, it wasn't an immediate scene to clean up. It no. was... It Parents was couldn't there for see days. their children, and it was there for days. And then the helicopters, which you know, get a, you know, I'm sure it, it does our hard. whole community there. But even here, when we hear the helicopters and the sirens all the time, that's very hard for our family because it went on for weeks and weeks after that because news um, stations and and we're just on our our streets were blocked. There you couldn't get out of our main streets um, for weeks and weeks. And so, which brings us back to thoughts and prayers. That's once again, it's coming up on um, Ju Friday, July thirty first. And Jack, tell us the when and where and uh, about the for the town hall afterwards. Um, with the help of our very talented producer Andrew Apple, who we all know very well, um, it is going to be on Friday evening, July thirty first, at five p.m. Pacific time. Um, the play is about 80 minutes. There will not be an intermission. We want to keep people as engaged as we possibly can. I don't think people in theater land have ever seen anything quite like this surrounding this topic. This is a play about gun violence and the politics of the NRA, and it gets pretty down and dirty. So if you're at all interested in curing the problem of gun violence, I invite everybody to please tune in. Afterwards, we have a very special, and I mean special, virtual town hall to discuss gun violence, which people will be able to do because they'll see the texts coming in from themselves in the audience or any other audience member will come in during the show commenting on the play that they're looking at but then afterwards, during the town hall, we expect to have text questions being submitted to our panel of four wonderful people, two of whom we have on the air today. And um, those questions will be answered by the likes of Fred Guttenberg, who is the father of daughter Jamie Guttenberg, who was tragically killed on that day. We'll have the father of... Uh, Guac Oliver, whose name is Manny Oliver, and he will be there online. Both of these gentlemen will be live from Parkland, Florida, along with Don and Andy, who are here today. 